Hey, we're here at Alpha Vedic Farm with uh, Deb and our good friend Josh Biggleson, who's been here for about a week or so. So, what do you think of the little farm here, our medicinal herb farm? It's definitely nice and peaceful out here. See you guys up at the crack of dawn working every day on the farm. It's pretty cool, too. And I'll wake up around mid morning and jump in to see if I can help as well. But yeah, really nice out here. And I think uh, one takeaway for you uh, that you've learned here is to never volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what my paycheck is at the end of the week. <laughs> uh, did we tell you about volunteer, what that really means? <laughs> Happy to help. No, it's, yeah. it's been unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, you've helped so much. And, uh, you know, we're blessed. A lot of people come to the farm and, and they always give a hand. But uh, you've been uh, extra helpful. Oh, so, yeah. uh, you know, usually it's just Deb and I here and... And, uh, you know, we work long hours and, and you know, we're, we're getting through things, but whenever you get an extra hand, it's, it's a great morale booster for Deb and I. Nice. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed yes, helping. Definitely. You know, I look forward to having something like this in the future, so it's good training for me. Yeah. You know, so I definitely enjoyed it. So any word from our, uh, from our farm mascot here? Well, I think we ought to acknowledge that this is our initial launching of... Um, Friends at the farm, shall we call it, mm -hmm. and um, just talk about what's going on here and the goals that, that we've set for ourselves and what we've accomplished so far. And uh, I think people might want to hear that because we get questions all the time okay. from, uh, you know, emails, people asking if they can come visit, um, what we're doing, how we're doing it. So we've been very blessed with a lot of great folks that have shown up here. Yeah. And our mission statement here at the Alpha Vedic Medicinal Herb Farm, if uh, folks don't know, is that we're creating a prototype uh, for four small farms, five to ten acres, that can be duplicated, what we're doing here in every community across the country to kind of disperse the, uh, the supply grid so that we aren't all centralized into you know, one dependent system where we get our food, where we grow our herbs for medicine, and also just to reconnect people to the land because that's the, the, the main thing that, you know, we found here is that uh, when people visit, you know, from their typical urban dwellings, they uh, really are out of touch. They appreciate it, but it gets, it yeah. takes them a little time to become comfortable because mm -hmm. there's uh, no cell service here. There's, yeah none of the typical amenities, but uh, w would you say that we're roughing it here? On, at the <laughs> Not <time>? at all. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Yeah, it took, you know, I thought it would take me a few days to settle in here because I'm used to a lot more people, you know. And yeah, as soon as I got here, I felt like the brain relaxed and said, oh, thank God I'm here. So settled right in. And then you jump on the river down there and it brings you right back home, yeah. you know. It forces you right back into your body in a lot of ways, you know. So I've, I've been loving it. You know, I thought there would be more of an adjustment period, but... No, oh, feels real nice. Feels like yeah. home. Nice sleeping with the sound of the river. Huh? Yep. Deb and Absolutely. I, uh, you know, we have our windows wide open all the time, so we get the jungle noises outside, the river in the background. And, yep. And, uh, yeah, I think most people wouldn't need to uh, keep their sleep apnea machines and everything mm -hmm. much longer if they lived in a proper environment. Yep. Also with yep. abundant oxygen and just basically a lot of mana in the air. You know, there's actually life force here that because everything is alive, you know, you, you aren't surrounded by cement and power lines and yeah. that really saps the energy that uh, people, you know, really don't have a clue as far as how deep that goes. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the brain definitely relaxed here, which is not the norm for me. Yeah. You know, so yeah, no, no telephone wires, no stoplights, thank God, you know, yeah. nothing like that, no people honking their horns and yeah. neighbors coming over and bothering you. It was, it was, <laughs> Except for us. Well, you yeah. know, present company excluded. <laughs> You know. But I think for people that are tuning in for the first time, um, let them know we are living off grid. In Northern California, about 20 miles from the Oregon border, we are on the shore of the Smith River. And uh, this has been an off grid community always. There's no power back here. Once you turn off into the road that leads through the canyon, um, there's no power here, except for, the, for those of us that have, we have solar. We have solar panels, we have uh, 
generators if and when needed in case of emergency, but it, we are very blessed to be in probably one of the most pristine spots in all of California. And we're native Californians, so we can testify this is really untouched back in this area. And uh, most critical is water. Uh, we have the cleanest river in the country probably. Uh, it's just pristine. It looks tropical. It's so clear, except it's ice cold year-round because a lot of it comes subterranean. So a lot of the river water is actually primal water. Uh, the water we drink squirts right out of the mountainside through miles of bedrock. That's definitely primal water. And it really makes a difference with uh, what we grow here. Uh, you know, the plants aren't chlorinated and, you know, yeah. it's, it's structured the way nature intends it. So, yeah. so that's important for farming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Josh, you and I and, and, and Deb, you know, we, we have a kind of a parallel thread of experience. Um, you grew up uh, with your dad, who was uh, very well known. Uh, I've known about him for years. I never really worked with him, but very well uh, aware of his work. And now I'm learning more of the nuances of his work through you and your brother, Adam. And... Um, you know, I've always just loosely called myself a bioterrain medicine physician, uh, even though I, I integrate a lot of things. But the whole point is that uh, I look at myself as an ecologist for the body. Uh, you're yeah. not treating disease, you're not treating germs, but instead you're understanding how to assess the environment, the internal environment of the body, and then put that right. And in my experience, um, things kind of get better more often than not, yep. uh, even though you're not in an adversarial uh, role with treating the body as we, you know, come to uh, expect with allopathic medicine. Yep. So uh, maybe share a little bit of your experience. You know, we have kids that are just kind of in your age group. They grew up uh, with Deb and I and what we were doing treating people from all over the world and mm -hmm. and uh, you had a kind of a vantage point in your household too seeing your dad yep. uh, who practiced actually in some similar ways and yep. and also um, hung out with some some of the people that I hung out with in my early days so yep. what's it like growing up in that situation oh well it was awesome you know, there there was the ups and downs of, of watching your dad help people and then get in trouble for it, you know, which is, is, is kind of altering my path a little bit to, to, to figure out what I really want to be doing, because, yeah, he basically got crucified, and you know, you've known people like this, it's happened to you even too, you know, it can be thankless sometimes, and you can kind of be on the island sometimes all by yourself, so at times it's been very isolating, but my upbringing was fantastic, I don't think I realized the magnitude of it, of what he'd been through, probably until... 2014 when the last clinic got raided and shut down and then I started to we started to lecture and I started to go back into his history and I we would talk about his history in the lectures and you could really see all the stuff that he had been through and you know he would break through here and do this really great thing and then he'd be attacked he'd break through here and do something really great and then he'd be attacked so it was a very interesting upbringing I know we did that summit with you recently and somebody asked us when did we first learned about the terrain theory and we said we never knew any different this is just kind of what we, we grew up in. And it's been really nice being here because we've used a lot of analogies as far as the garden, the soil, and our body. It's the same thing. And, you know, we've been harping on, and I, I think you have too, that people think we're separate than nature as opposed to being a part of nature. And we have created a whole race of people that is separate than nature, you know, and they're not assisting nature, they're not supporting nature, and then we wondered why we're in some of the pro having some of the problems that we're having. So to, to be here... You know, it's helping me connect some puzzle pieces as far as stories that we can start to incorporate. You know, the soil is key. If you have healthy soil, then good things grow. It's the same thing in our body. You know, we talk about parasites all the time. And I get offended these days when people are blaming things on parasites. The problem is your parasites. You know, somebody told me eye floaters are parasites in your eyeballs and things like that. It's just like, it kind of kills me a little bit, you know. So... When we were talking, and you just talk about the soil, and no farmer is unhappy when there's worms in the garden. None. Right? So why is it any different than our, in our body? And this is an interesting question I want to ask you, Bear, because 
We've been using the isopathic remedies for a long time, the Sanum remedies. And for, for those of you that don't know, they are the waste product of germs, who scary germs, right? So, and the farmers explain it. It's, it's easier to explain with soil than it is in the body because people understand it a little bit more. So I got to see Dr. Alan Williams speak, who is a great regenerative agriculturist, and he talked about, yep, in the, in the soil, you've got the bacteria, the, there's nutrients in the soil, but you need the microbiology to process those nutrients. So the bacteria go in there and they, they clean everything up and their waste product is nutrients for the soil. Same thing in our body. We have bacteria in there. It's helping to clean things up. The waste product is nutrients and that's what those remedies were. So then they talked about when things get pathogenic, all right, which is one of Dad's Orwellian words. And to us, pathogenic is just out of balance. So when things become out of balance, the waste product of the bacteria just gets gobbled up by the other bacteria. So the soil or our body doesn't get to absorb the nutrients. So here the parasites come in. These wonderful parasites that are there to help your soil, externally and internally. So if they're processing the bacteria on a higher scale and processing more nutrients, I've been thinking recently, what about remedies that are using the waste product of parasites? Because we've done so well with the waste products of bacteria and fungus, that if it's a higher scale of nutrients or larger scale, more nutrients, um, would that be something that could be really helpful to the human body? Well, you and I know the answer to that. <laughs> but uh, sure, you know, the isopathics, if you understand, they are exactly what you just explained. Um, you know, we talk about biology a lot and about chemistry, but the old timers, going back a few centuries, understood yeah. everything was about resonance. When I'm working on the farm here, I understand there's a whole resonance between our bodies and the soil, uh, the plants. And when I practice acupuncture, I understand that the meridian system in the body is also a homeostatic mechanism to communicate our electrical system with the electrical system in the soil. So these organisms, when we take them in a supplemental form, they're the indigenous organisms in our body, and they actually morphologically change to meet any need that the body supply or, or is, uh, needs. So when you take them, if you have some of these organisms that have been doing a good job for us, uh, scavenging and so forth, working in conjunction with other organisms such as so-called parasites. Um, the only parasites I know of uh, are not in the natural order. They're more out there in the banking system and places like that. But um, <laughs> uh, you have this communication between these all of these natural organisms and they will downregulate in other words, the organisms that have been playing a scavenger role, if their job is done, uh, the remedies will downregulate and put them back into their kind of waiting uh, on the sideline as, as troops, you know, ready for action. Mm -hmm. Or else they can actually upregulate. Uh, they also are repopulating uh, in, in the event that a person's ecology is compromised, which most people are these days, because of all the things we're inundated with, um, it repopulates these these seeds, which are actually the seeds of life, is the way I look at them. They're what yep. uh, roughly zero point um, uh, zero one microns in size, uh -huh. um, and so that is what in uh, conventional thinking, you'd call the immune system, but you and I know. The immune yeah. system really isn't an immune system because there's nothing to be immune from. Yeah. There's nothing to fight or struggle against. Yeah. And what we're really doing is uh, just reseeding those elements that make the ecology function the way it works. Yeah. And it, you know, I like to think of it as, you know, my dad was a master mechanic. So I look at everything as a close kinematic chain. That means if you're looking at a Swiss watch, you know, every little gear depends on the other and they all move together. Yep. And it's the same thing in nature. If one little gear is affected in some way, whether it's microorganism, whether it's the elements that the microorganisms, you know, break down and make available in the soil, uh, whether it's the uh, parasites that are, you know, like uh, we had a, 
you know, slug issues here because we're surrounded by forest. Yeah. And uh, this year we did some electroculture and now yeah. the slug population is down simply because yeah. we're harnessing more atmospheric energy, electricity, bringing it into the soil. Uh -huh. It improves the, you know, the conditions of the soil. The organisms say thank you, we're feeling better now, the, the yeah. plants are feeling better and the slugs don't have to come in and gobble up as much of the stuff that we used to have to go out and you know try yeah. to prevent. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing in the body. It's about treating yeah. the ecology and of course Bouchamp uh, long ago who was probably we could call the, the father of uh, terrain yeah. uh, medicine, not theory. Mm -hmm. uh, conventional medicine with germ theory, that's a theory. Yeah. That's a theory. Yeah. Terrain is not a theory. If, you know, as you know, just sitting here in nature and yeah. observing how everything works on the farm, it's proof that this is the way things naturally work. Yeah. And uh, Deb uh, being kind of the, the master green thumb of the family, uh, you know, that has not gone through all the medical training but understands it probably better than most doctors on yeah, the planet absolutely. and also played uh, kind of a similar role with you you know kind of watching me from afar but also mm -hmm. managing our clinics and uh, yeah. you know talking to clients and really reading between the lines and understanding what's really making them ill yeah. because you know, about eighty percent of what makes us ill is our toxic emotions and belief systems and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, now we're all getting to play out in the garden, which is Deb's first love and kind of been my mentor out there as well. So, uh, how would you, uh, you know, just put all this from your perspective? Well, I'd say for the um, the lay person, but for gardeners and farmers alike, <clears throat> who are connected day in, day out. The original relationship, if you will, is the human body with plants. It, that is the original relationship on the earth. And in um, not so long ago, before the uh, drug industry captured a great, a great amount of the so-called healing, um, Hospitals used to have uh, greenhouses and gardens for people to go to that were recovering. The, the plants themselves generously transmit healing energy. That's why you can feel terrible, go out, work in your garden, and you, everything can shift for you because you're out of your brain and you're into your heart. And the gift of nature, again, is um, just the healing qualities that every plant has. It doesn't matter if it's a weed, what we call a weed, or what label we want to put on it. Mother Nature gives us her gifts. And unfortunately with the development across the globe, we're, and especially so many people around electronics now, um, not even knowing, young children not even knowing where milk comes from or where food comes from, that's the that we're at the tipping point i think for all of us right now to come full circle back to the earth and i'm seeing i'm really seeing um, a lot of people going back into herbal medicine a huge resurgence of people that work with plants in the healing arts it's great to see and that's what that will be the balance point for our planet and our relationship with the earth it must happen. It has to happen. Do you want to say a couple words about the concept of a physic garden and what doctors used to do? Oh, you go ahead, sweetie. Well, my favorite studies are going back a few centuries, and the original chemist or scientist, who now are known as alchemists, understood both sides of the equation. Uh, you know, doctors and the things I had to endure in my medical studies were, you know, were brought into this more of a materialistic notion and unlike, uh, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine where they appreciate the pervading chi, prana, god, whatever you, you know, you're comfortable with, um, you know, it's the glue that 
um, not only holds everything together but animates things in the first place. So uh, you become very aware of that, uh, you know, when you are practicing agriculture and, uh, you know, the way we do it here. Uh, also practicing medicine the way your dad did. And we're, you know, now reconnecting with our roots of those initial practitioners that uh, not only understood all this, but they brought it to a high level of science where they could mimic um, what nature was doing in their laboratories for, you know, uh, more efficient, more effective plant medicines and everything, but they really understood more than anything. It was a way for them to reconnect themselves and expand their awareness, feed their own soul. And it also, uh, you know, made me aware that all these physicians of old, scientists, period, their main endeavor was to heal themselves on all levels and help other people do the same. Whereas scientists these days are more about picking things apart and trying to find life in particles rather than understanding the life that animates those particles and puts them here in the first place. Yep. So they knew they had to grow their own plants in order to be part of that entire chain of creation. Yep. So um, it starts with agriculture, getting your hands in the dirt. And so they didn't buy their stuff online that somebody else made. Yeah. Uh, they had what was known as a physic garden. Grew their plants, got to know their plants yeah. uh, from day one. Uh, you know, when I look at the herbs and things I grow, and if I'm, you know, questioned by somebody, well, what herb should I take? I don't think in terms of little chemical uh, constituents that people have isolated in the laboratory, I'm looking at the personality of that plant. I'm looking at the personality of the individual that needs help. Yep. I'm looking at the morphology of the plant because just the way it grows, its shape, its characteristics tell you everything about on a deeper fundamental level how it works. And then when you look at an individual as a physician, uh, you can match things up very very well that way. Yeah. So um, now your dad uh, was really pioneered a level of microscopy and I think we had some similar roots in that we learned the old school technique from Germany, Belgium, you know, yeah. Gaston Naissons and you know studied all about Gunther Enderlein who developed the first microscope and mm -hmm. you know hung out with all those uh, those kind of folks. Um, maybe if, if you want to tell us a little bit about how their microscopes worked and and what your did, dad did that was very unique. There, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but first I'll piggyback on some of the things you were talking about, the plant, me the plant medicine. And yeah, it's definitely making a comeback. Um, but I don't think a lot of the, the people understand that you don't have to be ingesting the plant all the time to get medicine from the plants. Mm -hmm. You just be be around it. Just be around the trees, mm -hmm. you know. And we were talking about the secret life of plants the other uh -huh. day. Yes. You know, and just interrelationships. Right. And the farmers I work with in Spain talked about the most important thing we have to do is observe. You observe nature and you see how it works and see the familial relationships that they have. You know, so even though we're taking in an herb and using it, there was a whole relationship that herb had with that environment right there. Mm -hmm. So how are you juggling those herbs together? And they talked about, you know, modern day lumber, you know, where they, where they take down a whole grove of trees and they plant one tree. They, they plant 50 acres worth of cedar. So it's like you're taking out the whole family and then you're just planting the father. Well, the father has no family that it can create at that point in time. You wonder why those trees never mature the way they're supposed to because you've taken out their familial relationships. And they did studies on stumps that have been, you know, dead for a couple hundred years and there's things growing out of them and they found that the trees and the plants around them were providing that stump energy. You know, even though they were totally different species. So that, you know, in that interconnection just with plants and the environment is so important. So for me, you know, we, t we talk about it. I don't really take much anymore in the way of external medicine. I'll take some cell salts here and there. When something acute's going on, I'll take some of the osteopathics. But just being here, you know, and just getting my hands on the soul, e even putting tea in the bag was kind of, 
medicine for me. You know, and I think sometimes that gets lost in the translation these days. And not to mention, and I'll get to the, the blood a little bit, um, the words are power that Lady Emo Emoto talked about it. And we've talked about this with the herbalist calling the herb antibacterial or antifungal. This is not the way nature works. Nature doesn't evolve through antagonism. It, it's all symbiotic. So if words are power, I believe they're actually weakening the energy of the herb before you even put it in your body by calling it anti-anything. So if anything, it's pro-bacteria. It, it's pro-inflammatory. It, it's it's, it's pro-fungal, pro-parasitic. You know, so there's a bit of a fundam fundamental misunderstanding of these people coming up and using these words, and I think it's an important piece to the puzzle. And just a quick comment yeah. I'd like you to respond to yeah. is behind all the antagonistic kind of mindset, yeah. uh, there's more than just a little bit of fear. So maybe what happens when fear is a motive for taking anything? Yeah, but that's supposedly what is the lowest frequency we could have is fear, and it's, it's used to control us these days. So. You know, even when I look at the blood, there's nothing of, nothing that scares me in there. It's just this is the body telling you certain things that need attention. You know, so, yeah, we don't get we don't get anywhere. We don't evolve through fear. We get controlled by fear. You know, so it does not come into our equation. And, you know, Dad was, you know, used to working, as you were too, probably with the worst of the worst of the worst. They'd been through traditional medicine and been destroyed. They'd been through alternative medicine and not got what they needed. And then they find you and they, and they find my dad. And they come and petrified. And the one thing that he really did that I really loved was he took the fear out of them. You know, they still might be going through something really heavy, but at least he helped them understand it and helped them understand why it was happening and the steps they could hopefully do to start to reverse that. You know, and that's where, for us, that's where the microscope came in. So the traditional microscope is a light phase where the light goes directly through the, through the slide. Um, dark field splits the beams, which is the exact way a hologram is made. So if you look at, um, it's very basic, but... Um, dolphins or bats use an echolocation, they throw out an energy field, it hits a disturbance field, then you get an imprint of the disturbance field, and that's the way our microscopes are designed. So, and um, they've been doing dark field for, God, it's only about 150 years now, maybe? So, so not very long. But when they would see these images in, in the microscope that were larger than the cells, they didn't realize they were holograms, they thought they were artifacts, they were dirt of the slide. Well, those dirt of the slide tend to look like organs. Uh, they tend to look like something that's going on in the person's body. So when Dad had his first teacher, she kept picking up what the, what the root cause of the person's issue was by looking at these holograms. And the root cause of the issue was not a germ. <laughs> you know, there was always some sort of dysbiosis in there that set the person off center. So he didn't believe it because he's a left brain scientist. You know, this is just dirt on the slide. But she's like, there's a broken arm right there. Can't you see that? She's taking out the anatomy books. So over the process of about a year, she's doing this over and over and over again until he realizes she's just reading patterns, right? And that's exactly, that's exactly what we do. Now, I never knew any different. You know, I kind of just grew up in it. So we, we've attempted to train some people in the past, but it's hard to get through the, what they've been trained. Uh, we do see lots of things coming up these days with a lot of bad guesses based on what these holograms are, and we're not going to really get into that um, for now. But the blood, just like the ear, just like the eye, just like the foot, has a hologram in it and it relates to certain parts of the body. So all we're doing when we're reading the blood is we're reading what your body is telling us is needed. Yeah. And it's nice and simplistic. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that we live in a unified realm. You know, we have the sky clock above that is emanating resonance all the time. It's, a, it's an electrical system. We have, uh, through the constellations, uh, you know, you have a modification or a modulation of that energy or that electricity. Then that electricity is received on the ground by all the capacitors. Capacitors and electricity are things that gather and store energy, receive it. Uh, we're capacitors. We're receiving that resonance all the time. And uh, just basic understanding these days, uh, you know, we have something that people talk about a lot. It's called cymatics. That means if you create a resonance and, uh, you know, like particles of sand on a plate will coalesce into a very specific geometric form with that same resonance every single time. So it's uh, not a matter of um, conjecture anymore that uh, form and function is created by the geometry that is in turn created by resonance. So bringing that full circle back to um, the microscope and things that, you know, your dad uh, pioneered, doesn't it make sense 
that if something, uh, a resonant field that is created by our own little prism, you know, in our consciousness, it's, uh, you know, our emotions, our beliefs and things, mm -hmm. it's not only going to create a, a certain specific change in form and function, but then, uh, as the old alchemists knew, uh, as above, so below. So does, doesn't that have, that resonance have to affect every single thing, including little shapes and forms in, in the plasma? It has to. It has to. And even, you know, we'll see images, and we, we don't talk about this often, about, you know, we'll see images off the blood that's on the slide that's almost like it's in their biofield, and it's certainly correlating to what's going on in their body. And it's like, why am I seeing a colon over here? You know, and... Sometimes it's a way of the person isn't ready to, to deal with that, right? So it's just off on the ethers. On the other side, are they drawing it in because they are ready to deal with it? So and that's kind of the puzzle pieces we have to put together. But yeah, it could be dirt on the slide, but just like cymatic, it's, it's actually forming into something very specific based on what's going on in their energy field. Yeah, very straightforward. Pretty logical. I'd uh, say um, yeah. out of all the people over the years of patient care, um, the easiest and the ones that heal very rapidly, at least that's our experience, are children. Because they have not had a lifetime of rigidity, belief systems, uh, programming, hypnosis, if you will. Um, children will shift and make those changes and we saw uh, amazing almost miracles. instantly, yeah. yeah, we did. We saw, we saw, we were very blessed to see a lot of children heal rapidly one or two yeah. treatments sometimes and it, it completely shifted yeah. and um, so what you're talking about are it when you become older and again I use the word rigid because that's I'd say was yeah. the block always are these um, the inability for adults particularly to just get out of their head trust, know there's a plan, and um, the body is a garden, and have you been taking care of your garden? What have you done to your garden? Yeah. Um, you know, how's your emotional garden feeling? How's the physical, are you treating it with respect and kindness? Um, again, it, it always leads back, to, for me, it leads back to the relationship with the earth. Yeah. Well, the, the more we sever our uh, connection with nature, of course, um, we lose, number one, trust. Uh, when you're living in an artificial environment, you're inundated with uh, energetic overlays created by cell towers and God knows what. Uh, when your body has um, pharmaceuticals in it, that change the resonance tremendously, override, you know, the, the natural rhythms. Um, all these things, you know, just always being on a schedule, uh, being uh, preoccupied with doing something you don't like every day because you think you need to make money. Yeah. Well, now you're so divorced from the natural realm. And, and I appreciate that, you know, people are in that situation. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of a contrived control grid, but that aside, um, you, you, w without that, that constant um, conscious uh, understanding of the interplay between ourselves and nature, uh, you become very dependent on all these synthetic artifacts yeah. and, and, and lose the ability just to look and see what's in front of your eyes in nature and realize, you know, everything's okay, which would also tell you how things work out there and the fact that it works the same within us, yeah. which goes right back to, uh, you know, holograms. Well, we've both been working for years, yeah. basically. Now, I worked um, more traditional terrain microscopy where I was more preoccupied with looking at, you know, the little pleomorphic changes, how these yeah. organisms morphologically change into different stages to provide certain functions. And that was important to me, uh, you know, as I integrated that with other kinds of tests to understand what's going on in the body. Now, when I started hearing about your dad's work, and then especially uh, watching you here today, uh, at, well, since you've been here the last few days, um, it really helps me appreciate even deeper that 
all the other things that I'm interested in and have integrated in my work, including, you know, in my alchemical lab and so forth, um, looking at the holograms in the blood is really a deeper appreciation than just maybe all the years where I was just focused in on the organisms themselves and their byproducts, which is very helpful and it helped me, you know, help other people. But the next level, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, exactly what you guys have been doing a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and I have had a few discussions uh, as we're looking at things together under the microscope on how we can maybe employ other modalities to help those, to help interpret what those holograms are yeah. really telling us yeah. and to uh, have uh, maybe be able to elaborate on their story a little bit more. Yeah, there's so much in there that I don't know that I'll never know, you know, and dad was very, you know, it was like a drill instructor where you have to be honest about what you know and honest about what you don't know. Yeah. And the puzzle pieces are always there. And that's the, the brilliance of his work was, yeah, you know, you're looking at holograms, but you're looking at the activity. You look at the shapes of the red cells, you look at what the bions are doing. So there's this, there's a symbiosis that's going on in there, but it's pointing you in a certain direction and you have to be able to figure out what road to take to get to that point. So it's really putting those puzzle pieces together. So yeah, I, I might see, you know, a giant platelet over here, which represents some area of trapped inflammation. And uh, for all of those out there who don't know, inflammation is good for you, it's how we heal. Trapped inflammation is when we start to have some issues. So I might see a giant platelet, so I'll know there's some trapped inflammation, but that's only telling me a piece of the puzzle. But now if I'm seeing a scar disturbance right next to it, then the uterus, now then I can start to put the puzzle pieces together that, oh, maybe there was a procedure done in that area that's contributing to the trapped inflammation in the area. So we've got to break down those dams and let the body start to flow properly. So it's easy to pick up on certain holograms, but putting the puzzle pieces together is really the art of what my dad did. And it, it's, it's like a dance you're doing in there. And when you start to put the puzzle pieces together, it starts to get exciting. You know, I talk out loud to myself when I'm reading blood. Sometimes I'll look at it the next day, you know, but it's like, okay, I know that's a piece of the puzzle. I don't know how it fits in right now, but I'm going to file that in the back of my brain. And it'll come full circle by the end. So by the end of our reading, the answer is there. And if the answer isn't there, that means I missed it. Because mm -hmm. the answer is always there. All, all I'm doing is reading the holographic interpretation of what's going on in your terrain. Yeah. yeah, and then you have, you have throughout history, and it's not discussed that much unless people have exhausted the allopathic method. But think of all the different tools, if you will, or modalities that have come, from, you know, forward. For instance, how many years of acupuncture that unblock channels? Yeah. Of course, the herbal remedies. There's many. There's been really incredible. Uh, tools that have come forward and could be utilized to help with that that um, I think every doctor should know how to, to do a, um, a myriad of those tools yeah. right. and be able to whatever the, the body needs know what it needs at that time and to help it yeah. uh, keep don't block just keep it moving keep that flow happening yeah, got to get the river flowing again. And I don't understand it from Bear's experience. I just can feel it. And mm -hmm. a lot of people can feel it. That's one thing about being in practice all those years is uh, most people would find their way to him when they had been educating themselves and knew that there was alternatives out there. And logically, it, that makes sense. Yeah. The way they find their way to your dad, to you and your brother. Yep. Um, there are other choices, and I would encourage anybody, don't stop searching. Yeah. Know that, trust your, trust your instinct. And, and the sooner the better. I, I loved what you said about the children. And then as we get older, we, we become rigid. Because, yeah, children are so much easier to take care of. Even uh, uh, Robert Fulford, who you're kind of aware of, a wonderful osteopath. Uh, but as he got older, he wouldn't treat you if you're over the age of 12. Because he didn't want to deal with the adults' <laughs> crap anymore. Right. Right? Just didn't want to deal with that. Oh, 12 was it. That's the, that, usually, yeah, that 11, it. 12, that's where yeah. that brain really kicks in. Yeah. And the trust as a child uh, seems to diminish quite a Hormones bit. Hormones get involved a little bit. You know, yeah. if you can catch yeah, it before those great. teeth solidify, it made a right. big difference. You well, know? how many patients did we have that uh, they bring their children in 
and we'd say, well, actually, we have to treat you <laughs> yeah. yes. because the yep. child is manifesting your ills. Yep. Yes. And if, if you don't clean up your act, then, uh, you know, we can only have limited success with your child. Yep. And then there's, that's the Hawaiian. That was pono the pono. whole pono pono. Yep. Same thing. Someone yep. was I expressing illness in the family. Well, it wasn't just that person. They had to, tr the whole family needed um, shifting. Yep. and yep. change yep. so uh, yes we're all connected and everything is connected so yeah, um, yeah that's you always had to dad realize but the heavy cases you had to treat the whole family because mm -hmm. you know they right. were reacting to what was going on if the child was sick he knew it was you know a lesson for the parents and did mm -hmm. the parents get that lesson mm -hmm. yeah um, also in the so-called natural healing arts we have to understand that even yeah <laughs> um, acupuncture for instance uh, the old masters, uh, a couple thousand years ago, weren't just sticking needles in people. They were setting yeah. bones, like osteopathy. Yeah. They were uh, masters at reading your energy. They could read you like a book. Uh, they could put their hands on other parts of your body uh, and know what's going on in every part of your body. They were master herbalists, understood herbs from more of that uh, you know, comprehensive energetic level. And so now, uh, you know, you get little bits of that, but it's just like conventional uh, allopaths, people are more specialized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Ayurvedic uh, practitioners back in the day understood the principles of transmutation. So if the body was lacking something and needed that something, it would take what was available, something else, and transmute it into what mm -hmm. it needed, yep. which uh, you know brings us to more recent times where folks like Walter Russell now are explaining, so our Western minds can understand how all of nature works in cycles, okay. and how everything from uh, elements in the ground that we would think of as separate elements on the periodic table of chemistry are actually uh, a, a state of fluctuating resonance and all of those uh, elements will then transmute into another distinctly different element yep. when the resonance change by its movement through the different octaves which is the way everything operates in our realm from up above to down in the ground. Yeah, that's classic pleomorphism. Yeah. You know, changing based on the environment to what it, it needs. Which reminds me of the conversation we had about the forests. Mm -hmm. So I was sharing with Josh, and he knew this as well, that there was a, I read a recently, not recently, a few years back, there was a forester from Europe who wrote a book and that he had r recognized that in a forest that they, the trees actually uh, communicated with each other through the root systems. Yeah. And that if one tree was in distress, something there was a weakness or it was being attacked by a certain, um, you know, a bug, something that was doing harm, it could send out the messages to the rest of the forest yeah. and they would already adapt and be able to repel any of the damage that this tree was experiencing so again we're not separate everything adapts and is communicates with each other i, I that was that one would i was i've always known that nature communicated but that yeah. one was just knocked yeah. me out when i heard that i thought that yeah. was the greatest thing i'd ever absolutely uh, discovered in, in you know in reading yep. now try to fathom that the kingdom of mankind which is the highest pinnacle of creation within this realm and the steward over the other three kingdoms, the mineral, plant, and animal kingdom, which means we have all the attributes of all those kingdoms, including the plant kingdom and the trees communicating. So yeah. do we think that somehow uh, as individuals, whether we're here sitting with each other or you know, a few thousand miles away on a different continent that we aren't affecting each other somehow. And what if um, we were all taught to be at odds with each other and uh, to really look at each other adversarial 
in, in that perspective. And, and uh, so we're always talking about is peace on this planet mm -hmm. possible? And we're looking at politicians and military and everybody as solutions to bring about world peace. Well, it really starts with each one of us individually to have a light bulb come on and say, well, let's at least not be part of the problem yeah. and uh, start thinking in that manner so that we can maybe start turning this thing around. I know? think that's a good, um, I think that's a good summary of it is peace within and then and then radiate peace without yeah and that that's the hope for our future yeah well and nature does nothing that. in isolation no even though they've tried to isolate us recently it does nothing in isolation so you kind of need that whole unit to to evolve and we've become so disconnected from nature you know and there was a couple of little things i'll finish up on that the farmers noticed that they said when animals became domesticated they ate for taste mm -hmm. And in the wild, they eat for health. And we watched on this farm, the cows would go out and they had to analyze what each cow was eating. And the cows that had bad bowels going on, they were all going over to this one plant because they knew they'd ate too much of this plant, so they needed this to self-medicate. So the animals inherently knew what was good for them. But once they became domesticated, they're just lining up for their feed bags. They're eating for taste. <laughs> right? And the other part of it, in this world where everybody likes to have an external input as opposed to working internally. And we talked about this when they started to supplement their soil, that the, the roots developed very shallow roots on, on the plants. And they stopped developing mycorrhizal connections down below. So all those important nutrients that those roots would be going down to, to, to search for weren't in the plant, right? Because you were giving them supplements on top. So it was one of those things, you know, we're not supplement people, but how is long-term supplements in your own body, what is that, what kind of connection is that going to inhibit as part of our own internal nature? Mm -hmm. You know, so as opposed to being afraid to make these connections, we're so disconnected that we're actually cutting off these connections to things that are symbiotic with us. Mm -hmm. So if we can get back into nature and observe how it works a little bit, then it might give us some lessons that we forgot. And uh, likewise, a consciousness is operating on that uh, level of superficiality um, it's not just making ourselves weaker by what you're describing, but also that isolation or the perception of isolation yeah. is, uh, let's just say, impeding our ability to grow roots into other realms of consciousness yeah, the truth. that would bring us all the way home. Yeah. 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 So I think that... Uh, Very simplistic. Yeah, now yeah. that we've solved... Uh, <laughs> all the world's issues yep. we'll go out here radiate more peace and uh and i've got some seeds to plant today go actually. play in the garden go swim I've in got, the river i've out. got an area we call the salad bowl and it's it gets partial sun because up here we hit triple digit temperatures so i've got a second round of salad going in but in a different location she the lettuce is too tender needs needs some shade one last thing i'd uh, like a comment from you josh is uh, you know we talked a little bit about our mission statement here at alpha vedic farms but yep. um how about the biggleson academy uh oh yeah what are you guys up to and and yep. uh tell us about your direction and what you hope to achieve yeah it's all about education you know, we're, we're doing the same exact thing. We're just more correlated to what's going on in the body. But really, we're kind of doing the same exact thing. We're trying to teach people how the body works. We're trying to teach people how nature works. Mm -hmm. It's part of, the, part of the reason I'm getting into the crossover with some of the farmers I've been working with, some of the farmers we've interviewed, is they understand more about health, human health, than doctors do. And part of that's by default. <laughs> but they really understand what's going on in nature. So you know, our, our goal is to educate you know, while we'll still do consultations, you know, people can send us their blood and, and we'll do consultations for them. The goal is to really educate people so they don't get sick, but so they understand how nature works, so they understand how we are not separate than nature. Mm -hmm. So we'll do monthly webinars, we'll interview wonderful people like yourself. The list of people we can interview is getting shorter, because there's only so many people out there that we really resonate with, you know. Uh, we've interviewed some really wonderful farmers too, which is, which is a lot of fun. So, yeah, the goal at this point is education. Teach people how the body works. We are no different than nature. The worm's good in, in the garden. The worm's good in our body. It's doing a very specific job. I like right? that one. <laughs> Sounds like a new bumper sticker. There we go.
<laughs> you know how, pe how many people we'd offend with that one? <laughs> and we've, uh, we're creating our own networks uh, in the process. We're all finding each other through resonance. Uh, you know, we find mm -hmm. yeah. who we resonate with. And I, I think we're off to a good start, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with uh, really making some good changes. And, yeah. and then we're also living at a time where all that doesn't work is uh, very evident to anybody that opens their eyes. Yeah. And uh, I think what we're all trying to do is to provide a soft landing for folks that uh, want to try something different. And then that's one thing we don't do is we don't talk about what the problem is. Yeah. Maybe it'll be 30 seconds here just so people know what we're talking about. But there's plenty of people out there talking about what the problem is. And we're not interested anymore. Yeah. Right? You know, we're looking at solutions and the solutions are going back to nature. Yeah. Well, you hear self-sustainable use that a lot. Yeah. Well, self-sustainable is life itself. Yep. And I believe that uh, the, uh, the methods of being unsustainable, yep. they'll just take care of themselves. They'll, they'll just have to, I mean, they won't be able to continue. Yep. Whether it's the human body, or the, the earth itself, wherever there's the damage done, there's solution, yep. but the other will just... It'll just... It's not going to provide the solution. It's not going to... No, and it's not going to last either, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, Dad wrote a great article back in the 90s called Don't Call Him Alternative. And the <laughs> point was there is no there is no alternative the way nature works. Right. right? This is oh, it. I like that. That's but, great. And that's very, very yeah. simple. So, yeah, that's but, great. You know, if we're trying to educate people on how nature works, and the more I get to hang out with you guys, get my hands in the garden, the more I get to talk to the farmers, the more it all fits perfectly into what we're trying mm -hmm. to achieve. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for being with us yeah, here. Thanks. It's been uh, awesome. a lot of fun, yeah, and uh, I know we'll be in cahoots for <laughs> many years to come. Yeah, really, yeah. really enjoy awesome. it. Awesome. Yeah. Really enjoy thanks, it. Jeff. What you guys are doing out here is what we all should be doing in some form. Yeah. You know, getting back to the land, working with the soil, getting our hands dirty. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> well, you're welcome to come here and get your hands dirty anytime you <laughs> anytime. want. Anytime. I had a good time. <laughs> okay.